Jesus is near and strengthen each other with words of good cheer, with zeal ever buoyant and courage never slack. Be true to our Savior and never Grace and peace to you, brethren. Grace and peace to you, everyone. I do apologize for you not hearing the beginning of that song. I did not realize it wasn't being played. Um, well, it was being played, but I thought it was being um, transmitted over the internet. So, grace and peace to you. We will replay that song coming down to the end of the Bible study this evening. My name is Brother Sheflon Ballantyne of the Thusia Seventh-day Adventist Church and I want to welcome you to another program with us this evening, another Bible study hour. We are going into the scriptures, we are going to understand truths from the scriptures. We are looking at Hebrews chapter 10 as you see the topic is warning and exhortation or that should be warnings and exhortations. And this is what we're going to focus on this evening. Please share the live. Please share the live as much as you can. This helps us to fight the censorship. And it helps to bring this before the eyeballs of many people who will benefit by God's grace. If there are any issues with my audio, please let me know early so that I can fix accordingly. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Loving Father who art in heaven, thank you so much for your love towards us. Do forgive me from all idols now and help me dear Father as I speak to speak the truth from your Holy Spirit and nothing but the truth. In Jesus' holy name I pray that others will come to know you and accept the character of Christ before it is too late. In Jesus' holy name, Amen. So grace and peace to you, grace and peace to you, my dear brethren and friends. Don't forget to share the live. Grace and peace to you, Sister Avlin, Brother Midon, grace and peace to you. And to Sister Karima as well, grace and peace to you. And uh, let me take the opportunity to share on, um, share this live as much as I can. And then we're going to begin with, our, well, we're going to begin by looking into the scriptures in Revelation, in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Okay. So the song that you heard, which you'll be hearing, is a song that speaks about a commitment not to draw back. Not to draw back from the path that God has placed us. Not to draw back from the plan of salvation that God has made available to us. He has provided it for our salvation from sin. And to a very large degree, this is the encouragement we are given in the book of Hebrews, the latter part thereof. So let me remind you of the outline that I showed you from Brother Medina's book, Studies on Justification, Righteousness and Salvation, under the chapter Hebrews, a bird's eye view. He gave an outline of the chapter, chapter 10. And what I want to show you is a chart that has that outline here um, for chapter 10. All right, just bear with me a second. Let me pull it up make sure that I have it okay I think I think there was an error there was a replacement it was actually replaced so I'll work on getting that back back up as quickly as possible but Hebrews chapter 10 um, Hebrews chapter 10 can be divided into four and this is this these are the points that are covered 
As you look at Hebrews chapter 10, as even as we started this study last week in this chapter, um, we saw that the law of sacrifices could not take away sin. The law of sacrifices could not take away sin. And we saw that from reading the very first few verses. We're going to go through the entire chapter in a, in a very quick way this evening. But we saw that from reading the, the first few verses in the book of Hebrews. Now, what else did we see? We also saw that Christ incarnated, he was incarnated to reveal the real sacrifice for sin. After all, he was the real sacrifice for sin. All right, so we saw that. And uh, what else did we see? Okay, so here. All right, so what else did we see? We also saw, hmm, we also saw that the new covenant of the law in the heart is by Christ who mediates over the house of God. All right, we saw that. And what we're going to see this evening is that we must draw near to Christ in assurance and to beware of the unpardonable sin and have confidence. So that is what we're going to look at this evening. We're going to see all of that here this evening. All right. Um, I'm having a little issue here, a little technical issue. Just bear with me a second. Let me fix this. Mm. All right, let's see. Okay, let's see how we're going to fix this quickly. Um, all right. All right. These things happen, right? So my my um my topic and so on is gone. But we're looking at Hebrews chapter ten. So let's get straight into it one time. Rereading or reviewing what we looked at last week. Okay, in Hebrews chapter ten, this is what we are told from verse one. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things could never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually made the commas thereunto perfect. So that is what we saw last week. We also saw in verse 2, For then will they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in, these, in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls son of goats should take away sin. So we saw clearly from the scripture here that the blood of bulls son of goats could not take away sin. That the law of sacrifices, that is what was being referred to there, could not take away sin. The issue with God and man is that God desires sin to be taken away from us because our problem is sin. That's our fundamental problem, sin in the heart. And here the scripture is saying, look at what could not take it away. The blood of bulls and of goats could not take it away. But the remaining verses tell, tell us clearly that in, in verse, verse 5, it says, Wherefore, or for this reason, when he cometh into the world, when who cometh into the world? This is referring to Jesus Christ. So the Bible is telling us here, that when Jesus Christ cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. So a statement is made, which continues, In burnt offering and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Now we looked at this in detail last week, showing, seeing from scriptures that indeed Paul is correct. God made statements in different parts of the scriptures showing that he does not desire sacrifices on, on offerings because what has happened was that these the, the, the lesson that these sacrifices and offerings were to show 
this was totally lost sight of and the symbols became the meaning of these symbols became corrupted and so god made the declaration sacrifices and offering i do not want and he said that to the children of israel in isaiah as well because these symbols we understood from previous studies were as an object lesson pointing to jesus christ and the plan of salvation it was to teach and retain a knowledge of the plan of salvation among the children of Israel, among the converted of Yahweh. And they, they, they were totally corrupted. That knowledge was totally corrupted. And as a result of that, God says, away with it. Now, what else does the Bible tell us? <clears throat> we saw last week as well that, we saw last week as well, that what God requires or what he delights in is justification from sin. And the scripture also tells us that he delights in obedience in 1 Samuel, obedience to his commandments in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 22. So we saw all of that last week. And so what, what Jesus Christ, the statement he makes here that Paul quotes is correct. But he makes a second statement in verse 7 he says the bible says then said i lo i come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will o god now what really is the will of god we know the will of god is expressed in his law in psalms and we'll see this as well as we go into into the into some of the verses that are coming up psalms 40 and verse 8 tells us that the will of god is his law so when it comes to jesus christ he fulfilled the law he actually obeyed the law we are told in sinful human flesh he fulfilled the will of yahweh and he worked out the entire plan of salvation while he was in sinful human flesh and he carved away for us to be saved the, the scripture says uh, later on uh, consecrated a new and living way so we saw all of that what else did we see in verse 8 it says above when he says sacrifice an offering and burnt offering an offering for sin thou wouldest not neither had 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 pleasure therein which are offered by the law then said he lo i come to do thy will O god he take it away the first and he established the second he established the second. So this is showing us that the sacrificial system, the sacrificial system was indeed abolished. They were abolished at the death of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that the veil was rented. It was torn in, in two at the death of Jesus Christ. Now, the veil there that was torn in two was the veil of the sanctuary. And that, uh, that was symbolic of the death of Jesus Christ himself. Because the scripture will go on to tell us that the veil is the flesh of Jesus Christ. Right here in the same chapter, chapter 10 of Hebrews. So all of this is important for us to understand. And the scripture go on to tell us in verse 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So it is through Jesus Christ we are made holy. It is through Jesus Christ we are separated from sin. And every priest, verse 11, standeth daily ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man... After he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For, for henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now the right hand of God is important for us to understand. We will not be able to go through a, a detailed study into the right hand of God. But we know that this is referring to, this is not referring to general heaven as the evangelical 
as evangelicals put it. But instead, this is referring to the mediator role of Jesus Christ, the salvific role of Jesus Christ. So here Jesus Christ, the right hand is the right hand of salvation. Here he is, he ascended into heaven to be our mediator, to perform the mediator role in the sanctuary, to mediate the plan of salvation that he has worked out for us to be saved thereby, to mediate the character of Christ to us for us to be saved, to mediate blood as the scripture uh, identifies it, which is the life of Jesus Christ, which is a knowledge of God and Christ. This is what Jesus Christ uh, sitting on the right hand of God actually means. And that is what he did. But he went, the Bible says, which it will specify even further as we go on in, in, in this chapter, he went in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary or the heavenly Hagia. So let's continue looking at verse 13. Verse 13 says, For From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Did you see that? Why by one offering he perfected forever. Notice the issue here was that the blood of bulls and of goats, which were offered ever so often, always, throughout the year, these, the blood of these bulls and of goats could not take away sin. But one sacrifice, the scripture says, which is Jesus Christ himself, actually, it says, perfected forever them that are sanctified. So that sacrifice is potent, it is capable, it is effective in actually sanctifying you or maintaining sin-freeness in your experience. Separate you from sin and maintaining sin-freeness in your experience forever. And this is what the blood of bulls and goats could not accomplish. They were never meant to accomplish that, by the way. So in verse 14, verse 15, we are told, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Set Yahweh. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds and in their minds will I write them. So here we are told this is the covenant. This is what Jesus Christ is mediating in the sanctuary. At the time when this, these words were written, he was in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary or the heavenly Hagia. But here he is at this, uh, here he is the Bible is identifying what he's mediating here, which accomplishes salvation or perfects us. It is the law he is right, he's putting into our hearts and writing in our minds. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 14, the Bible tells us that the law is spiritual. So it is the it is the law as it as it embodies the character of Christ, the spiritual law that is placed into our hearts, therefore making us perfect or separating us from sin. Did you see that? And this is what Jesus Christ is mediating for us. This is what he is actually sprinkling or ad ad administering to us from the heavenly sanctuary. At this point, when Paul was writing this, he was in the first apartment. Right now, he is in the second apartment doing this work, but doing also blotting out, the work of blotting out. Now, this is, this is very important. This is very important. What else are we told? We are told, so let's reread re verse 16. It says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts 
and in their minds will I write them. So this is not a case where this is a this is a no come. We looked at this when we looked at Hebrews chapter eight, and I encourage you to look at Hebrews chapter eight to understand the studies. Look at the studies on Hebrews chapter eight that went before. But this is not a no come covenant. This is the experience of justification being described here. The experience of separation from sin being described here. And so, those who claim that the Sabbath has been abolished and who claim that we are under a new covenant as in a now come covenant, here we are told, the will of God being expressed here is that his law be written in your heart, in my heart. This is what we are told here. And the law here is the character of Christ, the spiritual law. What are we told in verse 17? And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So here we are told, the law is to be written in their hearts. And we are told in verse 17, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. When will this take place? This takes place in the investigative judgment in the second apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. So here Paul is for a brief while transitioning into the work of the second apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly Hagia Hagion. Verse 18 says, Now where remission of, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sins. Verse 19. So we looked at all of this last week and I, and I encourage you to look back at the, the Bible study from last week. Verse 19 tells us, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now what is, hol what is the holiest there? There are several things from this verse that we need to take note of. The Bible is telling us here, Having therefore, brethren, boldness. The original Greek for boldness there is outspokenness. So having therefore, brethren, the outspokenness to enter in into the holiest. You know what the word holiest there is in the Greek? It is hagia. And hagia we understood from previous studies, uh, when we looked at chapter 9, Hagia is the word used for first apartment. But first apartment where? In the heavenly sanctuary. So this is speaking about the Hagia, the heavenly Hagia. And here, the brethren are being invited to enter in and shown that you enter in with boldness into the first apartment by the blood of Jesus. Did you see that? So we enter in to the first apartment by the blood of Jesus. Um, Paul is saying, and the blood of Jesus Christ we saw from previous studies is not his literal blood because he did not collect his literal blood and took it into heaven to be sprinkled literally on objects in heaven but this blood is the life of Jesus Christ which is a knowledge according to John chapter 17 and verse 3 the knowledge of God and Christ so this is this is important important reminders here brethren it goes on in verse 20 so it means that the saints can enter in according to verse 90 19 into the heavenly sanctuary by faith and they can cooperate with Christ there by faith into the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary verse 20 says by a new and living way which he had consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh 
So the Bible calls the veil his flesh here. Right? The Bible calls the veil his flesh. So it is saying clearly that he consecrated a way. And we looked at this as well. And it was done through his flesh. It was while he was in flesh that he suffered according to Hebrews. And this is one of my favorite verses. In Hebrews chapter, chapter 7, where it says that, um, let, let me find it back here. All right. In Hebrews chapter, all right, chapter 5, sorry, where it says, Do he, verse 8, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. All right, I should read verse 7. It says, Who in the days of his flesh? So in the days of his flesh, the Bible says he consecrated away. So who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he, he fared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author or causer of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Did you see that? So the scripture is saying he qualified as the author, the causer of eternal salvation. This is him consecrating away. This is him consecrating away according to chapter 10, a new and living way. And he consecrated this new and living way through, through the veil or through his flesh. And this is what we are told in chapter, chapter 5. That he in fact became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obeyed him. That obey him. Based upon what? Verses 7 and, verse, verses seven and 8 tell us. Alright? So he worked out the plan of salvation in his life. In his living in his flesh and that that word of truth that faith is what he's mediating to us that which he worked out the character of christ which he worked out is what he mediates to us for our salvation so he is in fact the high priest he is in fact the priest who is, who is called of god high priest after the order of melchizedek and he is the one who, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through his veil, that is, his flesh. Verse 21 tells us, back to Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 21 tells us, And having an high priest over the house of God. Right? So it, this identifies Jesus Christ as the high priest over the house of God. I was reading a quotation from Sister White earlier today where she says that Christ is the foundation of the house of God. He's the foundation of the house of God, right? We are told here, and you can appreciate that, after all, he is the sacrifice. He is the high priest. He is the one who mediates the life. So it means that he is in fact the foundation of the house of God, right? And this house of God here is the heavenly sanctuary. Let's look at verse 21. And here's where the exhortations and warnings begin in verse 21. We are told this. In verse 21. By the way, verse, 20, verse 22. But verse 21 tells us where he's mediating from. He's mediating from the sanctuary. He's mediating from the sanctuary in heaven. All right? Grace and peace to you, everyone. Let me take the opportunity to greet uh, Sister Ariel, Sister Christine, Sister Linda, Brother Seb. Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace, Sister Anicia, Carrie. 
Sister Corina Hippolyte, grace and peace to you all. Sister Anne-Marie, Sister Amanda, Alyssa, Sister Alyssa, Sister Marva, grace and peace to you all. Brother Midan as well. And everyone, grace and peace to you, right? Amen. So let's let's get back into verse 22. Verse 22 tells us this. And we are going to read from verse 22 to verse 25. Because in this section of the exhortation from Paul in this chapter, in this section, we are encouraged or the brethren are encouraged that they must draw near to Christ in full assurance. Let's see. Verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart. Okay? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. So let us draw near with a true heart or honest heart, sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now there are, there are, there are several things that you gather from this verse alone, but it is pointing out to us clearly that one, your conscience must be sprinkled or your heart must be sprinkled from an evil conscience which shows subjective justification. Subjective justification. And secondly, that this subjective justification must take place before the washing of the body. This subjective justification must take place before the washing of the body or water baptism. But here they are, they, we are being encouraged to draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. So the faith is what assures us. The faith is what gives us the confidence and the faith is the revealed truths of the plan of salvation. We're going into Hebrews chapter 11 from next week, which gives us the definition for faith. But in chapter 11 and verse 1, we are told, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then verse 3 says, Through faith, we understand. So faith is the understanding. It is the evidence. It is the proof. It is the title deed of things not seen and of things hoped for. And that is, that is what gives full assurance because evidence is what gives assurance. It is only by having evidence or proof that we are assured of a matter or of a thing. So it means then that the central issue here is faith, the revealed truths of Jesus Christ. And this is what we are told. Draw near with a pure or with a with a sincere heart, an honest heart, in full assurance of the faith or in the full assurance that the faith has given to you. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, so we have been purged, justification has taken place, and our bodies washed with pure water. Justification before baptism. Verse, verse uh, 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love 
unto good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. End of quote. So this is a very important passage for us. And it is important for, for many reasons. But I want to point out that the Bible is actually telling us the benefit for assembling together and why we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There are some who will find excuses not to assemble together with their brethren. And here the Bible is showing that when that is done, you are doing as the man of some, but also you are not availing yourself of what God has instituted for the exhortation of one another. Because verse, four, verse 24 tells us, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So it means then that you are distancing yourself from God's plan for his church in exhorting one another and in provoking one another unto good works and unto love. That is what the scripture is telling us here. So whatever excuse you may think of, these are just excuses that come from a heart that has some idol, whether it be you have a problem with a sister or a brother, or whatever the case, whatever excuse. Here the Bible is telling us, even in spite of an issue you may have, we are not to forsake the assembling ourselves together, but it, it, we are to use this opportunity to provoke each other, to exhort each other, to encourage each other unto love and unto good works. So this is the, this is the purpose given here for, ex, for assembling together. This is what the scripture is telling us. And that is why on Sabbath we, we sit down in church, whether it be in Trinidad or in St. Vincent, we follow. And we have the opportunity there as brethren to fellowship and to exhort one another and to encourage each other into sanctification because we understand time is late. And this is the opportunity that, and this is the, this, this is the structure God has put in place to ensure that we do not apostatize from the faith, to ensure that we do not backslide to the point where we commit the unpardonable sin. And this is what the remaining verses will be dealing with. So it means that we should not uh, forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. You know, some people will take this scripture and they will turn it in a way to justify staying away or being isolated from the brethren. This scripture cannot be used like that because it is plain. All right. So let's look at the other other passage, the remainder of the chapter, chapter 10. And let's take our time and read this carefully. Grace and peace to, to you all again, even as you come in. Grace and peace to you, Sister Sion. Grace and peace to you. Um, grace and peace to you all, right? Ariel, Sister Ariel, the day, what is the day approaching? Is it the time of Christ's second coming? Of course it is. All right. Let's look at verse 26. Verse 26 tells us, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. I want to read that again. It says, For if we sin willfully, that after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Now, this is speaking of a person, well, it will go on to describe, it will go on to describe. So let me just, let me just read on verse 27. It says, but a certain 
fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And then the reference is made to Moses. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three weaknesses. Now we want to get a sense of, of who is being described here when the scripture says, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice of sin. Let, let's, let's zoom in a bit by seeing, based upon verse 28, what was the experience under Moses. So we look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 26 and 20. Uh, Deuteronomy 17 from verse 2 to 6. Deuteronomy chapter 17 from verse 2 to verse 6. Now follow this carefully. And this is a warning that is given here. So Deuteronomy chapter 6. Did I say Deuteronomy 6? No, Deuteronomy chapter 17. From verse 2 to 6, it says, If there be found among you within any of thy gates, which Yahweh thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of Yahweh thy God, and in transgressing <clears throat> his covenant, and had gone and served other gods, and worshipped them, either the sun or moon, or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel, thou shalt, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which had committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones till they die. At the, month, at the mouth sorry, of two weaknesses or three weaknesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one weakness he shall not be put to death. End of quote. Right? So this is what Paul was making reference to. And he makes this statement in verse 28. Follow the structure of this verse. It says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three weaknesses. So you're looking at a person who has gone into apostasy. This person has actually gone and served other gods even the son, according to Deuteronomy. And that is the extent of the, the despising of the law. And what does the scripture say? He dies. He dies. Based on the testimony of two or three weaknesses. And he dies without mercy. Let us go on to verse 29. To understand the comparison. It says... Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing or a common thing and had done despite unto the Spirit of, of grace? Did you see that? So here you have someone who knew the truth, apostatized from the truth, and gone to the very point of, according to the scripture, doing despite unto the spirit of grace. So this is a clear rejection of the Holy Spirit, insulting the Holy Spirit. You know what it is to insult the Holy Spirit? It means that this person has committed the unpardonable sin. And this is what the warning is against. Here you have the Bible saying, go back to verse 26. 
So we understand in the context of verse 26 here, even clearer when we read down uh, verses 28 and 29. Here you have in verse 26, it says, For if we sin willfully or willingly, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. So you have the knowledge of the truth. You have received the knowledge of the truth. And you apostatize from it. You willingly reject it. You turn away from the truth. But the Bible does not, not, doesn't only say you turn away from the truth. It goes on to describe your behavior towards Jesus Christ. The plan of salvation. Look at what it says. It says in verse 29 again, it says, describing the person and their action, it says, of, of how much sorrow punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who are trodden underfoot the Son of God. Did you see that? So you actually trample the Son of God. You know what it is to trample the Son of God underfoot? It is to reject and despise and totally discard the plan of salvation. Even after you, saw, you see clearly through the revealed truths, through the faith, that this is the only potent, the only uh, effective plan that, that can actually take you out of sin. That can actually sanctify you or separate you from sin. You look at all of that and you reject that. And you go on after idols. To the point where you commit the unpardonable sin. This is what following the Roman Catholic Church leads you into, you know. Because the, according to the book of Daniel, the Catholic Church trampled the sanctuary underfoot. It brought the sanctuary down to the ground. And it trampled the truths. So it is the very truths concerning the Son of God. The one who came in sinful human flesh and consecrated a way, a new, right? A new and living way, according to verse 20. You, you take in his ministry. You take in the person of Jesus Christ because you mangle the understanding of who Jesus Christ is. You say that Jesus Christ was actually born in sinless flesh because Mary had sinless flesh and there's some immaculate conception and all of that. And then you come and you say that instead of going into the sanctuary like the scripture points out for forgiveness by faith, approaching with an honest heart, seeking forgiveness from Jesus Christ who is the high priest in the sanctuary, you must come to an earthly man who has a carnal mind and seek forgiveness from him because somehow he is in the sanctuary on earth. That is bringing the sanctuary to the ground, casting the sanctuary to the ground. All of this is, is shown in, in the book of Det uh, Daniel, but this is what the Catholic Church has done. And so you have insulted the truth, you have rejected the truth, you have insulted the spirit of grace. Spirit that brings grace, which saves us from our sins. This is the warning that we are given here. But this is not far removed from any of us if we fall back into sin and if we go into apostasy. Because we too can end up on the side of the King of the North, following the dogmas of the King of the North, ending up accepting the mark of the beast which is the mark of papal authority Sunday exaltation legislated so this, this is what the scripture is pointing out like we saw in, in the summary point I will not be able to put, bring it back up on screen but I can at least make reference to it the summary point that this passage tells us we are to beware of the unpardonable sin and to have confidence. This is the warning that is given us. Beware of the unpardonable sin because this is what is being described here. 
So verse 30 says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It means when you, when you commit the unpardonable sin, you are lost. There's no more sacrifice for sin. You have rejected it. You have rejected the whole plan of salvation. You have rejected Jesus Christ and his ministry in heaven. You have rejected that which God put in place to save you from your sins. You have rejected God. You have insulted the Holy Spirit. And what happens here is that you fall into the hands of the living God to be destroyed. This is what we are warned against. All right? This is what we are warned against. Now, we have a lot of evil angels trying things this evening, right? So, let's look at, um, let's continue with verse 32. There are some points that I want to make in relation to um, the unpardonable sin before we go on to verse 32. And I want to make reference to something here which itemize for us what we are rejecting and why when we commit the unpardonable sin and why we deserve the retributive justice of God because you have to understand you have to understand that when man sinned God actually withheld his wrath he withheld his wrath and he offers forgiveness and that forgiveness is offered through Christ that forgiveness entailed it takes in the provision providential grace takes in all of that and justification it takes in sanctification it takes in the whole plan the whole plan was a plan to forgive man from their sins think about that the whole plan was a plan or is a plan to forgive man from their sins in the book studies on justification righteousness and salvation under the chapter punishing justice or forgiving or forgiving justice which one we are given a nutshell of the plan of salvation and i want to make reference to these points because it's important we are told here and let me let me see if i can work something quickly to maybe be able to pull this up so that you can you can see it all right um Okay, so I'm going to try. I'm going to try something here. All right, so just bear with me a second. Let, let me just try and pull, because I want you to see these points. Okay, it's on page four. It's on page four thirty-three. I'll find it just now. Page 433. Alright, so here it is. Okay. Alright, so there we go. So this is it in a nutshell. All right, the plan of salvation in a nutshell. Okay, so I just want to make reference to this quickly um, because I think it's very important. Sorry, I don't have it in the form of a chart and I'm having some issues as well. Okay. 
All right. God gives us a revelation of the evils of sin through the death of Christ on the cross to create adequate repentance for sin in us. See what God did? He gives us a revelation of the evils of sin. So when we, when we understand the death of Christ, when we, what, what this is supposed to cause us to experience is suffering for sin. And this is supposed to, you know, as we behold the love of God towards us, as we see his righteousness, and we see our state, how rotten we are, we are to suffer for our sins. This is, this is God's plan, you know. He devised this so that repentance can occur in us. Now, with, this, with his true repentance, God can now forgive us by destroying the old sinful way of thinking, the carnal mind, and by giving us a new heart and spirit, the spiritual mind. So repentance, justification. Then we are placed on a probation to fight and overcome sin with the aid of the spirit and grace. Did you see that? So the same spirit of grace is who aids us during this probationary period as we fight and overcome sin. And then we are told if we are successful in the judgment or past sins, will be forgiven, will be forgiven by God's mercy. Now, why did I bring this up? I bring this up because it is all of this that is rejected by the person. It is all of this that is rejected by the individual who decides that he is going to insult the Holy Spirit. Oops. All right who decides that he's going to reject the Son of God. It is all of this that is rejected. And when you reject all of this, this whole plan of salvation, it means that you will receive the justice of God, his retributive justice. Okay? His retributive justice. So let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 32. We are told this. This is an exhortation. We are told, but call to, re re but call to remembrance, sorry, the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. All right? So this, this here, here they are being encouraged. Now remember, Paul is writing this to Hebrews, to a set of people who are Jews who have come into the church and they have been converted and he is writing this, this, this encouragement to them, an exhortation to them. It is applicable to the church generally. And he says, call to remembrance or remember the former days in which after you were enlightened, you endured a great fight of affliction. There's a reason why I emphasize fight. Partly, verse 33, partly, whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly, whilst you, beca whilst you became companions of them that were so used. So, Paul is pointing out, look, Remember, remember the times when you were afflicted. Remember the times after you were converted. Remember the times when you had to endure a great fight of affliction. When you are in a fight, it is for you to maintain your armor. It is for you to keep your armor, not to cast it away. So here he is telling them, you were in suffering in the past. Bring that back to your mind. Remember it and how you fought, you endured, you kept the faith even in sufferings. 
even in these sufferings. But he goes on to say that they were also made gazing stock. And the word for gazing stock there shows that it means it's, it's as if you are in a theater. Because the, the Greek word is actually um, one from which we get theater. A public spectacle. You're exposed to public scorn. Remember those days. Right? Remember. You suffered reproaches and afflictions. And partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. How did they become companion of the persecuted? They became companions because they suffered the same persecution as their persecuted brethren. And also they had sympathy towards. So that's how they became companions too. They had sympathy towards those who were suffering afflictions. And this is, this is to show the kind of personality traits we are to have to our brethren who are under persecution. Paul uses it himself as an example in verse 34. Let's read it. It says, For you had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Amen? Now, this is very encouraging. You know why? Because, let me just backtrack a little bit. In verse 33, he speaks about reproaches, and the Bible tells us it is Christ who is reproached. It is his reproach. Let, let's look at it in, in Romans chapter 15. So we need to remember when we are reproached, when we are regarded as fanatic and extremists, when we are, we, when we are scorned and made a public uh, spectacle, when we suffer because we stand up for liberty of conscience or a liberated conscience, we must understand that it is because of Christ in us, not we ourselves, but because of Christ in us. And it is that Christ in us who is hated by the persecutors. And so that's why Romans chapter 15 and verse 3 tells us this. Romans 15 and verse 3 says, For even Christ pleased not himself, but, it is, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Did you see that? So it is Christ who is being reproached. And we must bear that in mind. So even as the prime ministers of the countries, including St. Vincent, have been persecuting us here in St. Vincent because we stood for a liberated conscience. We are fighting to keep our liberated, our liberated conscience. We are experiencing a great fight of affliction. But the point is, it is Christ in us that is hated. And they are seeking to remove Christ from our hearts. That's what they are seeking to do. So the reproach is a reproach on Christ. So as they call us fanatic, they call us all kind of different names. But it is on Christ. Because of Christ in us. But verse 34 tells us that he's reminding them that they took joyfully, joyfully, you know, the spoiling of their goods. The saints there were, were plundered so many times over. Their goods were taken away. And what did they, how did they operate? With joy. They joyfully parted with their goods. You see that? They joyfully parted with their goods. Even as we suffer persecution here, we are to joyfully part with it. Say what? You know what? You can take my house. You can take my job. You can take whatever property I have. One thing you can't take is my liberated conscience. Because I will fight with faith to keep it. And my liberated conscience will tell me to rebuke you and show that your ultimate end is destruction in hell fires if you don't repent. Right? It takes all of that in as well. But we must remember what Matthew tells us. Jesus Christ in Matthew tells us that we are to rejoice. Let's read it. In Matthew chapter 5. Here's what we are told. Matthew chapter 5. From verse 10. It, it tells us this. 
it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. They actually said, the brethren here abandon their duties and are deemed to have resigned. Lies! All because we stood for liberty of conscience, right? Rejoice, the Bible says, and be exceeding glad. And for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So we are in good company. We are in righteous company. So the, the, the point is here. When we suffer persecution and our goods are taken away. Private property being taken away here, you know. Private property being taken away. The Bible says that they were joyful and even so must we. So must we be, right? It goes on, knowing in themselves that, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. You think anybody can plunder what God has in store for you? No. Nobody can write a law to tell you you can't have it. These petty tyrants can't do that. Wasting their time. Because it is in heaven. Alright? It is in heaven. The Bible says, Mort cannot spoil that. Thieves cannot enter to steal it. Right? It is there. Verse 35 says, Cast not away there for your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. There's something I want to say about this. Casting not away your confidence. Remember that Paul is encouraging and exhorting the brethren to endure their afflictions. And he referred to it as a great fight. They bring back to your mind those things. But he is doing all of this to encourage the brethren to be patient, to have endurance. So as they fight, endure in fighting with faith. And so he's saying here, cast not away there for your confidence. But the confidence is confidence in the plan of salvation. It's confidence in the faith of Jesus Christ. It is confidence in the in the incarnation which he has described in the first uh, few chapters of Hebrews in the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ in the effectiveness of his blood to actually cleanse us from our sins and sanctify us keep us to maintain sin freeness and to save us to the utmost according to chapter 7 and verse 25 you can't cast that away, because if you cast that away, you will end up, as a reprobate, you'll end up doing despite, the Bible says, to the spirit of grace. You'll end up in serious apostasy. He said, don't cast it away. Keep it. And the imagery is brought to mind of someone who is on the battlefield, and as he's battling, he gets weary, he's battling, and he decides to throw away his armor. He decides, you know what? I can't, I can't, I don't have confidence in this armor anymore. It's a shameful and a disgraceful thing for the king for whom he's fighting. And here he is. We know what will happen. He will die. We cannot cast away our confidence, right? We cannot cast away our confidence. We have to bear in mind that he is faithful who had promised. We have to bear in mind that according to the verse here, we have a great recompense of reward. We will be rewarded by God's grace, right? We will pass in the investigative judgment. 
if we are successful in this period of probation, let us be successful by God's grace, by keeping the faith and fighting with faith, enduring in the keeping of the commandments of God, retaining the character of Christ in us, developing good personality traits in preparation for the new earth society. What else are we told here in verse 26? We are told, for you have need of patience, you see, or endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Did you see that? So the probationary period that we are given is for us to do the will of God so that we can receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, this is a very interesting verse, and I want to, I want to move away from Hebrews chapter 10 into, into Habakkuk. Right? Into Habakkuk. And uh, to see something. But let me read verses 36 and 37, and then we'll go into Habakkuk. In verse 36, it says again, For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God. What is the will of God? Psalms 40. So I really need to, um, to make sure this is plugged in here. What is the will of God? Psalms 40 and verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. See the will of God there? The law of God in the heart. So after you do the law of God, so you are obedient, you are a commandment keeper, you might receive the promise. And then verse 37 says, For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. But what is required? What is required of you and me as we wait? Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. And we're going to see in the book of Habakkuk, that we are told something here very important. All right? So find with me Habakkuk chapter 2 and we are going to read a few verses here just before we end this evening. Very important passage. All right. Okay. Bear with me as I find it. All right. Because in Habakkuk chapter 2, we are told of what we we are told what we need. And when you read this, you see that we in fact need you see that we in fact need absolute humility. Absolute humility. All right? So Habakkuk chapter 2, we are reading two verses in it. Verses 3 and 4. It says here, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. This was the experience of the, of the Advent people as they expected Jesus Christ to come on October the 22nd, 1844, and he did not come. They got an appreciation of this verse even more. And they were encouraged through this verse to wait. Verse 4 says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. End of quote. So what is required is for the just to live by faith. That is what is required. But what is condemned? What should not, what should not find place in our experience? 
it says again, Behold, his soul was lifted up. His soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. So the experience of pride, the experience of selfness, that's why we need self nonness. Because if faith cannot be in you alongside self operating in you, nor in me, that's why our greatest need is self nonness. That we can truly live by the faith that God gives into our hearts. And this is what we are told. So we need absolute humility. We need absolute humility in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. We need absolute humility. Now, the remaining verses, the remaining two verses in Hebrews chapter 10, are two verses that we're going to look at even more when we look at Hebrews chapter 11. Because Hebrews chapter 11 is an exegesis of, we can say technically it begins in verse 38 and 39 of Hebrews chapter 10. So verse 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith, and if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Why? Because if you draw back, it means you have given up the faith. And the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you must have faith in order for, for God to have pleasure in you. That's what we are told here. And verse 39 says, But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. End of quote. So this, this is where... Um, Paul ends with a brief encouragement encouraging the brethren not to draw back but to believe unto the saving of their own souls and this is the encouragement that we are to take from Hebrews chapter 10 there are other things that can be touched in Hebrews chapter 10 including the issue of one saved always saved which is a false doctrine taught by many people today, and they use portions in Hebrews chapter 10 to support their falsehood, but we do not have the time to go through that this evening. What I want to leave you with is this. We are living at the doors of the second coming, at the doors of the, at, at the door of the end, we are living in the end. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Very soon, Christ himself will descend from heaven. But before he does, he will conclude the work of judgment in the second apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. We are now living in the antitypical day of atonement. These encouragements that have been given to the brethren which is, applies to us as the church as a whole, applies to us even more today. So the counsel to not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, consider one another, to exhort one another unto love and good works, that we ensure that we do not end up committing the unpardonable sin, but that we hold to the truth, we hold to the, to, 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 to the faith, which is our confidence, that we do not do despite to the spirit of grace, that we do not cast away our confidence in any way, but that we maintain the truth, that we fight with truth, that we do not draw back, but that we live by the faith. And this is what we have to work out in our experience, moment by moment, day by day. Time is late. And this is the opportunity God has given us. We are still within the probationary time. And it is for us to work out the fulfilling of the will of God in our experiences. To obey the commandments. To obey the voice of God. To make sure that we overcome our sins. That we develop good personality traits. That we deal with our faults. 
this is the opportunity God has given to us. And the benefit of scripture, even this passage, is that it actually helps us. Because these truths are truths that are relevant to us even now, much more now than before. Because the day is approaching. And this is not time. There was never a time, but if there was ever a time, this is not the time to draw back. This is my encouragement to you, my dear brethren. Just before, just before I pray, um, there are one or two comments here. Sister Ariel says, you know what I see, brother? How Hebrews 10, 29 concerning trodden on the foot, the Son of God. When we pollute the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath of Jesus, that is the seventh day Sabbath of Jesus, we do just this. We have trodden the Son of God on the foot. Amen. Amen. Right? You are correct. You are so correct. So, thank you for joining me for this evening's Bible study. I know another one is coming up next. Let us pray. Loving Father, thank you for your love towards us. Thank you for these exhortations. Thank you for these warnings. Help us not to do despite to the Holy Spirit, not to insult and reject the Holy Spirit. When he speaks to our minds concerning areas that we need to deal with when he convicts us of sin when he convicts us of righteousness which is administered to us from the second apartment today of the heavenly sanctuary and when he points out the retributive judgment that will fall upon us if we trample this plan of salvation underfoot Help us, dear Father, not to fall into the sin that is the unpardonable sin, but to hold the faith under all circumstances, to endure holding the faith, and to ensure that in the judgment, we, when our names come up, we are found enduring, holding the faith, and keeping your commandments. Pray for those who have not accepted you, that they will accept your character for salvation from sin, from their sins. This is my prayer. In your holy name, amen. So thank you once more. Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you all. And may God bless you. Sorry for the little technical issues we had tonight. May God bless you until we meet again next week in Jesus' holy name. Amen.